And uh, I just love uh, the U.S. hospitality. I spent five years in America when I was training in my Brooklyn's uh, method of healing. So I trained to be a chiropractor, first of all, in Los Angeles back in 1972. Uh, then I uh, did my naturopathic uh, uh, degree in Arizona, Scottsdale, as part after the chiropractic. And then I went back to Australia. This is just a brief overview of what happened to me in the last 50 or so years. Um, <clears throat> prior to that, I um, became a vegetarian when I first started to uh, lose the range of motion in my knee joints. I was playing a lot of sport at the time, rugby union and surf lifesaving in Australia, which is uh, the surf lifesaving there is sort of like a, a passage to manhood, you might say. And, um, I was eating a, a high protein, high fat type of diet at that stage in my late teens and early 20s. And by the time I reached 24, I was starting to pay the price for um, that sort of abnormal type of diet. And therefore, I uh, uh, started to look around conventionally and see what could be done to uh, help me as normal people do in those circumstances. But um, obviously uh, it comes from what you create within your own body, um, are the consequences that are exemplified. So, Luckily, at the time, there was a gentleman um, by the name of Paul Bragg, which some of you may have heard of, who um, <clears throat> was giving some lectures on the Gold Coast where I was at the time. And I attended one of those lectures and um, hey, it made sense to me. And um, so I thought, wow, if I've been doing these things, um, in the past to cause this condition that I was developing, an arthritic condition in my knees which had been di diagnosed um, as uh, an osteoarthritic condition and uh, the only way that uh, the conventional medical profession could help me was with um, an operation and uh, at then there was only a 50% chance of that operation being a success, they said. So, thought, oh, man, that's not that good. Um, so I thought, well, what other alternatives are there? And I uh, looked at the other alternatives. And uh, there was acupuncture, there was chiropractic, there was herbal medicine, all these things. And uh, that was just about as confusing as the uh, diagnosis that I'd already got. So um, I thought, well, it's better to use my own common sense. And luckily at the time, that lecture came up. Um, it uh, showed me that uh, my diet was way off the, the, uh, the normal, optimal diet for a human being. And um, uh, so I started to change. And within three months, the athletic condition was gone. I had um, uh, started to eat some living type of foods, and uh, I started on the journey to, uh, which still continues to this day, I might add. <clears throat> it's a long journey, but that's the way it should be. It shouldn't be a short journey, because that's cutting your life too short. You're going to cut your life off when you're 35 or, 30, or 40 or 45 with a heart attack or with a, um, a cancerous condition that develops in your body. Obviously, you're breaking nature's laws. So, the first thing to do is to find out what's, what nature um, uh, said that should be correct for us as a species. And so we, I looked at the, uh, uh, the other animals that ate 
meat and I thought, wow, look, I'm not a, a, a lion or a dog. I don't uh, have a, a very acidic type of stomach and I don't have a very short digestive tract. I've got a long digestive tract. More suited to be able to uh, break down um, the finer essences that are found in fruit. So um, I'm not a carnivore, so I shouldn't be eating that sort of stuff, that high protein, high, high uh, fat type of diet, which had resulted in my condition. Mind you, I was bulked up, I was um, uh, big like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and so I had plenty of big, huge muscles and everything like that. I was paddling the surf skis at the time, which are, uh, involve a lot of upper body and core muscles. And, but I was paying the price. I wasn't living in a balance. Now, that's the whole key to um, our way of living, I think, is balance. You know, balance between what's right. And each person has got to find their own balance. This has been my experience. <clears throat> so that's just by way of a short way of introduction, just saying that I started on the journey back then I'm 70 years old now, so I'm still feeling reasonably good and uh, yeah. happy and healthy to be able to share these type of uh, experiences with you. Um, <clears throat> my uh, talk today is going to be 100% uh, uh, raw versus raw to four. Now, um, I obviously thought at the first stage of my journey, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I can go straight into this uh, type of lifestyle a whole 100%, but I have to start out gradually. Okay, so still ate some cooked food. Just got married at the time. My wife wasn't a vegetarian, but she changed when she saw that I was um, giving up meat and fish and dairy and that sort of thing. We still had some dairy, but this was the thing. And um, so at the start of the journey, still eating some cooked food, but it would probably be 70% raw, 30% um, cooked. As we progressed, um, at least more as I progressed, I gradually was finding that I was not um, uh, needing to eat as much cooked food. Because let's face it, cooked food is an addiction. It becomes an addiction. And this is why, uh, in a nutshell, it's very difficult to really practice a, um, a rigid regime whereby you're still including some cooked foods with your raw foods because the raw foods are like a siren calling to you uh, but the cooked foods are even a stronger siren calling to you to come back and eat these comfort foods that you've been brought up with ever since you've been a little child. You know? You're conditioned, you are a product of your conditioning when you're young. When you're a child. Your parents mean everything to you. They're trying to feed you and do the best thing they know. But the trouble is, 99.9% .9 of parents only know what they've been taught. And, that, and this is the whole thing. It's a question of re-education and um, relearning. So even though they may have the well-intentioned um, uh, intentions to help you and love you. Often they're, to, they're feeding you the wrong things, they're putting poison into your bloodstream in the way of vaccinations, they're um, doing all these things which even though it's the right, they're well intentioned, it's actually the doing the wrong thing by you and creating a lot more uh, uh, problems down the track. And it's the same with the, the, uh, our diet, our uh, lifestyle. We've got to look out for those things which look good on the surface, but down the track, 
that you'll find they'll present problems. And I think in a nutshell, the law to the four, it's great. You should probably go on that and be on that um, if you're wanting to transition to 100%. And that should be your goal. 100% law should be your goal. I found on my journey that the 100% <coughs> law was the only way that I uh, fixed up niggling health conditions that had been existing in, in, in the past, like the arthritic and the, the joint pain. And, um, well, once I'd done that and get, get rid of that and going 100% uh, rule, obviously going back to doing a introducing more cooked food into the type of diet would be going backwards. So that's just by briefly by the way of introduction, but I'm just going to relate to you how it's how it's affected me being on both, both sides of the, um, the fence, you might say. One, one side of the fence is 100% raw, the other side of the fence is, say, brutal for or including some cooked food, because that's basically what it is. If you're saying if you're going to eat all raw up until 4 o'clock during the day, uh, and then after 4, you uh, have uh, some starches, some rice, some cooked stuff, some pasta, or whatever you eat. I'm not much into recipes because I'm listening to uh, more what nature provides us. So um, let me let me let me present to you what raw to four involves. If you're going raw um, to four o'clock, that means it should be mainly fruit. Okay, fruit should be the basis of your diet. We're a frugivorous species. We have a long intestinal tract. We have alkaline saliva. We have dentition in order to um, just chew on fruit, not to chew on flesh. We don't have a crop like a bird does that eats grain, <clears throat> like a, a chicken, for example. We have a saccular stomach, which has um, relatively weak hydrochloric acid in order to digest just the weak um, uh, uh, nature of uh, the nutrients found in fruit, rather than having a very acidic stomach in order to digest meat. And so all these things point to the fact that um, we have grasping hands and pluck off fruit off the tree, we have um, biocular vision, not stereoscopic vision right to the side so we can look and see fruit and pick it up off the tree. So all these things um, relate to the fact that the raw fruit is our primary of our diet. So that's the, what we should be primarily focused on and I think you all know that here. What's involved in Cooking and heating is, a, is causing molecular change. It's causing caramel, caramelization of uh, carbohydrates. It's causing deamination of proteins and their amino acids. So you're getting a breakdown um, of the basic structures in any foodstuff once you heat it. It causes molecular dis disruption. And once you present your body with that molecular disruption, it places a tremendous amount of strain on your body in order to, <clears throat> in order to um, try and utilize that food. And that is why that strain acts on different organs in the body, and that strain basically causes the weakest organ, organ to break down. It may be your liver, it may be your heart, it may be your brain. So those uh, areas are going to be the ones which um, break down in the end by the time you're 40 or 50 or 60. And um, that's 
what you've got to be aware of. You're mostly young people here, so be aware of it now, because later in life, um, it becomes a lot harder uh, if a person comes to me in their 70s or 80s and they want to change. It's remarkable what nature can do in order to try and work towards a cleansing and a, a rebuilding, because the body's inherent drive is to life preservation. Each cell, in the trillions of cells in your body, I've heard Doug say there's a hundred trillion cells, I've heard other people say there's 70 trillion, but we won't worry about those few extra trillion. Um, the, <laughs> the fact is that each cell in your body has a drive in order to survive, and no matter what, challenges are presented to that cell in the way of lack of nutrition, lack of oxygen, lack of uh, uh, cleansing um, uh, to that cell, it will try and adapt, it will try and preserve its life as long as possible. So you've got to say that the, the uh, inherent drive of every cell in your body life preservation, no matter what conditions are presented to it. So the thing is to present the optimal conditions to that cell in order that it will survive um, as long as possible. Now, I heard Doug mention yesterday um, about the Petri dish and the Alexis Carroll experiment where the uh, chicken heart was kept alive for a hundred generations by cleansing and by providing uh, optimal nutrition for that cell. So the cell is virtually uh, immortal. It will live forever. But why don't our cells live forever? It's because the balance in our metabolism is not absolutely 100% balanced. It's slightly balanced to where the uh, elimination of toxins isn't quite as efficient as the intake of nutrients. In other words, anabolism isn't, type of, isn't type, um, quite as efficient as catabolism, which is catabolism is the breakdown in cells and anabolism is the buildup in your cellular, cellular structure. So those two processes are quite in a balance. There's always a tendency not to quite eliminate the uh, uh, toxic buildup in the cell. Um, it will be retained to a certain extent, causing some cellular damage. So if that balance was 100%, you were eliminating as well as you were assimilating, the cell would be totally immortal in the body. But the fact is, it's not quite in balance, okay? And um, <clears throat> that's why we age. And no matter what, you're going to age no matter what type of diet you're on or whatever. But I um, would think that the uh, aging process can be greatly enhanced by, number one, optimal diet, number two, providing the... Uh, adequate oxygen and blood supply, movement, sunlight, you know all these factors involved in a, in a, a good lifestyle that can be going to promote health. So uh, if you look at our uh, lifespan, I think it should be uh, within the range of 120 years, 125 possibly, um, looking at the uh, uh, comparable ages of different animal species that uh, live out their allotted lifespan compared to the time that they reach maturity. Um, you should live at least five times longer than the time, the number of years that it takes you to reach maturity. So we should, we're reaching maturity about, um, between 21 and 25, so five times that in 120. We're, we're not really living on it as long as um, we should be, obviously. Um, so it might take a few generations to build up to that 
really um, a lot of lifespan. Hopefully, we can do it with our knowledge and awareness we gain through coming to events like the Woodstock Fruit Festival. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> cooking, then, a rotel four does cause damage to food. So, what you're uh, looking at is, uh, I've heard it said, oh, but it's a backup plan, you know. Yeah, sure, it's a backup plan, but it's a, that siren call calling you back into cooked foods, and you'll find that down the track, you'll start to think you'll be able to have a few more of them, a few more of them. Before you know it, it's two o'clock till uh, the time you're just starting to cook. And then be, before you know it, it's lunchtime I'm having cooked, you know? And it's just, that's just the way it goes. So anything like that, it's like a, possibly like a drug, even though I've never been into drugs luckily, or smoking cigarettes, and alcohol didn't taste very good to me, so I was never very uh, much of a drinker or anything like that. But I know through um, my own uh, experiences, experience with the patients, and experience with my extended family, that for example, alcohol, can be an insidious call once you start letting it into your life. And it's the same with cooked food, believe me. You've got to be uh, vigilant, and vigilance is the key. So <clears throat> I think your whole aim should be in order to, if you want to decide that you want to have a healthy lifestyle, you should decide, right, 100% raw should be your goal. And I found that in my life, um, that has been uh, proven to be correct. Um, if I can run by you an instant, instance of um, what really brought that home to me was the fact that, well, I've been married 30 years with my wife, um, and my ex wife now, um, and I lived the same lifestyle maybe for the first 15, 20 years of our marriage. <clears throat> both vegetarian, both mainly uh, um, probably, you know, 70, 75%, 80% raw. Um, the uh, rest of the diet still included some yogurt, some occasionally, I remember her making up souffles and stuff out of eggs. But not much bread. I was never particularly into bread. My wife liked bread, fair bit. Not too much rice or cooked grains, particularly. Quite a lot of salads, that sort of thing. Um, and she was um, a little bit more into going out, and she was a dancer and uh, ex model type. And she liked to be out in front of people. And I was uh, more a planter and. Uh, growing trees and stuff like that. So we got an orchard and um, I started, um, I had a, a property for 27 years, which um, I transformed from being a monoculture of sugar cane into a, um, really a, a fruit paradise um, with 200 durian trees. And, you know, but that's a whole different chapter of trees in the world. Um, our, our lives together then, um, started to deviate a little bit through the dietary factor. Um, I kind of wanted to refine my diet, and she said I was getting more radical. <coughs> and um, so that was okay. And that did lead, lead to a bit of a schism. Um, and later on, after I planted all these durians, and, uh, they started to fruit. And I was starting to live on them. In fact, I lived on durian alone for three months, no other food. <laughs> Rest durian. And um, because I had it on my trees and they were coming on, and, but she hated durian. And I used to have to go uh, 50 yards away to go to the shed to eat durian. <laughs> 
So uh -huh. eventually it came down to, okay, well, what's it going to be, Jurian or me? <laughs> <laughs> Jurian won <one> out. <laughs> The consequences of her lifestyle are still not going 100% um, raw. Resulted in her developing a benign brain tumour and some problem with a lump in her breast. And uh, which she seemed to overcome, but I, I'm, I was sure that when she was diagnosed with this benign brain tumour, it was causing some symptoms. Of Neurological symptoms, and so the uh, specialist that she consulted with said, um, From our point of view, we feel that it's best that this tumor is removed, and mm. otherwise, it could turn malignant. And so, she, did, she didn't really ask what I thought because we were actually divorced at this stage. I think she knew what I thought was you should leave it alone, you should go 100% rule, you should do a couple of um, short fasts, you should um, get, uh, allow your body the best chance that you can in order to correct the condition. No, she took the advice of the medical profession and went uh, and had the operation to remove the tumour. The tumour was removed fine, the operation was a success. But three weeks later, the wound hasn't healed, it's still oozing. Take her back down and fly her 2,000 kilometres back to the hospital. Uh, another operation to try and get to the seat of the infection. The infection was staphylococcal infection obtained from the from the hospital. Um, one thing leads to another. You get a medical intervention, it's like a snowball. If you're in their grasp, you get sucked in for what can we do next? What test do we have to do? This has gone on. Four operations later, three hour operations, she's still not right. She's still in the hospital as far as I left. I nearly didn't make it to the, uh, <coughs> to the uh, Woodstock Food Festival because of the fact that um, I thought I might have to go to funeral. So <coughs> luckily she survived that and was uh, able to come. But um, <laughs> the uh, thing is, what I'm trying to illustrate here is the fact that. She didn't go under the same rule, and I was identical lifestyle, so I could have been on that bed unless I was. Okay. That is just illustrating the difference between what I understand. So if you want to get everything right in your body, any questions? Okay. Yeah. He asked, what, what is my opinion on the typical day of 100% draw? Okay. <clears throat> I, I would uh, uh, start the day with uh, doing some exercises. Uh, that's the first thing. If your body doesn't need food, something up straight away, getting up in the morning. Do some stretching exercise. One of the things that I learned was that um, all the healing can take place in the portion, but <coughs> if you want something to heal, you've got to get adequate blood supply. So it's crazy, often with an injury, what do they do? The first thing they do is put ice on it. That is preventing blood supply. <coughs> Um, what does the body do when it wants to heal? It creates a fever. It raises temperature um, above 37 degrees, creates a fever, enzyme activity is increased, and um, you've got a tremendous amount of burning up of toxins. So, uh, heat and um, 
getting the extra blood supply in there is of paramount importance if you want healing to take place. So an answer to your question, a typical day would be getting up, not eating straight away, <coughs> doing some exercises of your choice, but this is a whole different field too. Um, I see a lot of people that are out jogging, running, and um, cardiovascular exercise, thinking that exercise is going to cure everything. It's not. Um, it'll stay in cure. Exercise has been proven that uh, it'll increase your lifespan by approximately two years if you exercise um, every day and maintain that exercise throughout your life which e e equals the amount of time that you've actually spent doing that exercise, so you might Shall I keep doing the exercise? Or shall I just sit back under a coconut palm? Um, so, the best type of exercise that you can think of or look at is a type of exercise that's going to be done fairly quickly and it's going to actually offset the many hours a day that you have to spend in your occupation doing a certain thing, which often involves sitting in front of a computer. Maybe it involves sitting driving a car, a taxi, or sitting down an office desk, or standing on these hard floors, concrete, you know? So, to offset that many hours a day, you should do something a few minutes of offsets that um, stress that you're placing on your body. Because what is the universal force that controls everything in our body is gravity, you know, it compresses us. Gravity is going to win in the end no matter what. Life is a struggle against gravity. A little uh, seed that germinates struggles against gravity to reach light, you know. Um, even we as children, you know, we get up and struggle to stand up and we get going and we're off at about nine months or a year's um, age. So, and as we progress, we're in youth, we're um, standing tall and straight, but as middle age gets over there, you get more stooped and you have a bit more round shoulders and then you see, go to the supermarket and you see the people on the canes and they're bulbous bodies that are all a product of their lifestyle for the last 30 or 40 years. And it's only a product of their lifestyle because they didn't know what to do to offset all these forces that are acting on their body. And their nutritional forces, their gravitational forces, you know, their, uh, uh, their forces from the outside, from the medical profession saying you've got to take this drug for that or that drug for this. All drugs are poisons, you know. There's only two things that you introduce into your body. It should be oxygen and um, pure oxygen and pure food. Um, you should probably get all your water that you need from your food. I never drink water. I get it all from the, um, the food that I eat. So, uh, the, the products uh, that you, you see, the consequences that you see, are the, the consequences of your actions for the last 30, 40, 50 years. And um, if you uh, don't want to be like the average, I don't know what the average um, uh, number of medications a, a person that is in their 60s uh, is in America, but I do know uh, the statistics from Europe. The average 65-year-old person in Europe is on eight medications per day. And, um, you know, I think it's even higher in America, I'm not sure. <coughs> yeah, you see, that's pretty incredible. They're all prompts. and. There's two things that, uh, as I mentioned before, that you should be aware of um, that you take into your body. It's either a food or it's a poison, quite frankly. You look at something like that, um, you look at a, uh, a fruit like a mango or whatever, and it's been provided by nature uh, as a beautiful sweet food. We've got sweet and we eat it. It's beautiful food. Now, we think of other things 
like uh, some of the green leaf uh, herbs and uh, uh, berries and stuff, and you eat them, and oh, they're bitter. Oh, that doesn't taste so good to me. That's got a lot of toxins in it, it's got a lot of poisons in it. It's not really a food, you know? So this is what you've got to be aware of. Um, medication, any medications are all poisons and they're directly off in, into your bloodstream rather than even going through the channel of your uh, digestive tract. So therefore, <coughs> your um, question should be, whatever you're introducing into your body, think of it, is it a food or is it a poison? If it's a poison, it's got to be broken down. Fluoride, you know, there is such a big thing going on in different parts of Australia at the moment, introducing fluoride into the water supply. Is that a, is that a food or is it poison? Of course it's a poison. Why do you need to take that into the system? Can't the people on the, the medical profession and the uh, scientific community see that? They can't see logic sometimes, you know, they're in their little channel and uh, they've got blinkers on. Um, they're not all omnilateral omni thinking is what they lack. All sided thinking. They can only see their little channel. And um, this is where it is difficult for us um, as uh, rural food is often to confront the outside world. So we've got to be aware of it. But I've, I've deviated from the question. <laughs> yeah. um, so exercise should be the first thing you do in the morning, it, uh, but it should be the right time of exercise. If you want to know the right time of exercise, do some of the classes here. Go to my class, go to Doug's class. Just, you know, uh, glean for yourself, find a balance. Um, I'll provide you with the, um, the tools to do the right type of exercise early in the morning so that you can uh, get your circulation going. Then you have um, some form of fruit. For me, it's papayas, um, uh, two good, decent, organic papayas with some uh, banana and passion fruit. Love passion fruit. And that's a beautiful breakfast, you know. Uh, so fruit is your breakfast. Um, I personally eat um, pretty well two meals a day. So you go to get to, that should be working towards less rather than more. So my second meal would be around about two o'clock. So that would either be um, some living type of food, more fruit, uh, some greens. I like sunflower greens. I can grow them in a small area and snip them off and use them fresh. Uh, and you can get the seed cheaply and uh, they're a good form of green. Maybe a green smoothie. Um, I, I have coconut in my diet because I live in the tropics and I eat sprouted coconut. So uh, sprouted coconut is a, if you come to my talk on coconut, I'll tell you um, the optimal form of coconut to use, which is a low fat form. But even eating young coconut is, is good because the uh, medium chain fatty acids are pretty well directly converted into energy. And uh, so they're not, um, not uh, going to store in fat in your body, <coughs> your waste, or your stomach. So that, that would be my uh, meal plan during the day. I don't uh, eat much after uh, 2 or 3 o'clock during the day um, because of my setup. I see patients in the afternoon, evening clinic. When I finish that, that's at about um, uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. And after that, I don't feel like eating. I've usually got a relax and um, uh, just catch up on the emails or do whatever I've got to do. So eating is not a big factor. I don't think you should eat um, uh, in the evening uh, and go to bed with a full stomach because that uh, is not um, beneficial to a good night's sleep. So pretty well that's the daily uh, thing from my angle. Any other questions? You were saying how um, running and other exercises like that is not very, well, it, it only extends your life by around two years. Um, the corrective exercises that you recommend, like, do they... Extend your life? I don't yeah. know. But, um, 
that, that, that will certainly extend your quality of life, okay? Um, because if you don't do them, you will end up with uh, uh, gravity starting to take its toll on your body. And um, that, that takes place at the labor in life, and because you're eating the way you, you are, um, you're going to live that long, so you might as well um, reap the benefits of living that long, you know? Me, personally, um, I find that it's better to feel like a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old when you're actually 70 than it is to feel like a 70-year-old when you're 80, you know? So, <laughs> Uh, uh, 
uh, detoxified and living in enough balance where you don't need to do all that juicing. You, I, I personally myself don't really do that much juicing, but I have green smoothies. But um, a juice is uh, a fractionated food, and the most beneficial foods are whole foods. Okay, but juicing is. Um, good as a transition and uh, I think it's yeah something we all free will should actually go through uh, because it will often help with uh, uh, providing adequate nutrients which have got to be provided with the fuel and this is um, what Don brings up in a lot of his talks is the fact that you've got to have uh, not only fuel taken in with the food, but you've got to have nutrients as well. And uh, juicing is a good way of getting those nutrients into your body as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So I just wanted to clarify. Right before you, you switch to 100%, because I'm not 100%. I'm eating good food. Yeah. So what were you eating? I mean, did you just switch from? I had some dairy products. I think yogurt was one of the things that I uh, used to think, wow, it's sort of a health food. And, uh, <laughs> But it was still causing me to get maybe once every uh, once a year to have get colds and um, you know a lot of elimination of mucus. And, um, that's what you'll find if you're uh, with, if you're still eating some dairy. Okay, is the mucus factor. It's the, um, but if you're eating just the cooked uh, starches, the cooked diet. Um, uh, you won't suffer quite as much from the mucus type of thing, but the actual build-up in acidity in your body will still be taking place, whereas your body is most comfortable with an alkaline type of environment. And <clears throat> so my, my type of diet, just before I was going, went 100% raw, I didn't just go 100% raw overnight, it was like you come forward like I lived on, as I said, I lived on fruit there perfectly for, uh, well, during the three months, and I was living on my own fruit farm. I wasn't taking notes, I suppose. I, I'm, I'm a bit slack like that, uh, I suppose. But, um, yeah, uh, I, I would say that my, my diet before going 100% raw was hanging on a little bit to um, some dairy, eating too many nuts and uh, thinking that, oh, I had to have cashews or I had to have some almonds and uh, but I, nowadays I seldom eat nuts, you know, I have nuts at all. So that's what it would be just before I went 100% raw, still a bit of dairy, still having a bit of, um, maybe once a week having a bit of steamed vegetables, but not that many, you know. yeah. Okay? Good. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, they do. Um, and I found out that first hand uh, back in the 70s. Uh, I was eating too many um, unripe pineapples and uh, commercially bought oranges and uh, caused uh, erosion of the enamel. And uh, I've got a brother that's a dentist and uh, he said, yeah, it was caused by the, the fruits. And, the, and after that, I started to eat a more alkaline type of diet in the respect that I was eating you know, more greens and sprouts, a lot of uh, alfalfa sprouts and, and sprouted seeds, uh, lentils and uh, chickpeas, but they're uh, purely gastric too, and so you've got to, uh, but that slowed down any um, uh, erosion or anything, but I think the best thing you can do is um, go to Don's talk on dentition and teeth this week and we'll provide you with all the answers better than I can in that respect, okay? Could you walk on your hands here right now? Could I? <laughs> I could. So I've already done the length of uh, seven tennis courts. <laughs> uh, well, would you? <laughs> Yeah, I was 25 when I gave up uh, meat, fish, and 
dairy. And I haven't touched it since. Apart from an occasional bug that flies into my mouth. You know, sometimes it did. But not intentionally, yeah. Yes, sir. After your morning exercise, do you make a point to eat right away? Or do you ever feel like you're more thirsty than you are hungry after your exercise in the morning? Uh, no, usually I'm more just hungry for a, uh, a juicy type of uh, um, fruit, you know, like a right away. papaya. Uh, right away, right about. If I do my uh, morning exercise right and um, uh, around about 9 or 10 o'clock, I'm uh, hungry again. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I eat fruit. Yeah. But, um, Try and eat organic and try and eat um, juicy type of fruit. Don't eat really, wouldn't have an avocado or anything like that. You know. yeah. but, and the durian, I'll probably have a good later. Yeah. Yes? What's the opinion on superfoods? Superfoods. Well, most superfoods are actually, uh, that's a misnomer for right from the start, superfoods. Superfoods are fruit. And, um, but, um, that term has been coined by uh, commercial uh, forces in order to make you think that you need them to shortcut nature. So, uh, uh, yes, so, so some food should be included in your diet, and you're saying that things like spirulina or like uh, what else is the, uh, Cacao. Cacao, no, cacao is not really. Cacao is a fruit, um, and it's it's nice eating. Uh, but uh, chocolate is made from cacao, um, but it's made from the seed and it's ground up. But the actual coating to the seed is beautiful. It's uh, it tastes like a mango. We have them growing. I've got them growing in my property. Look at it. So it's a superfood, yeah, but not because it's been commercially made. Uh, so my opinion on superfoods is you don't, you won't really need them in the 100% uh, raw stage, but you may need them in the transition stage. Okay. How many calories do you eat, and do you eat greens? I, mean, yeah. okay. uh, I probably, would, depending on my uh, activities, when I was climbing Mount Apo, uh, which is the highest mountain in the Philippines. Um, I used some more calories than I would normally, so we had quarters um, bringing up fruit. <laughs> no. uh, the simple answer to that question is how many calories do we eat? Probably about uh, between 1500 and 1800. How many greens do you eat a day, do you think? Uh, do I sometimes, yeah, I do sometimes have greens. <laughs> like I mentioned, those sunflower greens, especially. Mm -hmm. Occasionally kale, some green smoothies, and uh, I think uh, if you're traveling and uh, you need to take a concentrated form of greens, the dried powdered greens like barley grass or whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. um, when you first start the the question was, when I first started to change, were my family supported and siblings? All thought I was crazy, you know, <laughs> which I still am. <laughs> <laughs> 1145, that's the time I've got to finish because the next person is starting to hear it. Time for two. Yeah? Um, would you suggest moving to the tropics to get better quality food, eventually moving it? He said, why? Right, you've been married. <laughs> It's tough. I would, I, in a nutshell, yes. I did it myself. I was born in Scotland, but my parents luckily took me to New Zealand when I was about six years old. So I was brought up in New Zealand. New Zealand's still a temperate country. It was still too cold for me by the time I'd done university in New Zealand. And, uh, oh man, I need to get to a warm climate. So I went to Australia. And uh, I thought Brisbane was going to be warm, but it's only subtropical, it's not tropical. I have to move 2,000 kilometers north of Brisbane, closer to the equator, to get to the palm trees. 
Land is designed to live in the area of the palms. That's where we evolved, so where the palm trees grew. So I went back and I saw those palm trees and I learned how to climb the coconut. I knew I was happy. What do we do? We have to, we've got to, we've got to uh, think about uh, moving to some place. Yeah, yeah, hitchhike. <laughs> Thank you, Don.